Well, brethren, pick up your Bibles, if you would, and open them with me today to Revelation 5, Revelation chapter 5. And I'm going to read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Revelation 5, Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? But no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. And I cried and cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look at it. You know, this is, of course, in our time, where are our leaders? You know, you, you really, you look at what's going on in the world. If you follow the news even a little bit, we are living in very dangerous times. We really are. And, of course, our leaders are not righteous people. They are not worthy to take a look at what God's revelation and what God's will is. But that doesn't mean that the people of God don't know what's important. That doesn't mean that we don't have direction. That doesn't mean that we don't have wisdom of how we are to live in this age. No. Verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious, so that he may open the scroll and his seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls full filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. What a glorious picture. What a remarkable picture here of what the Apostle John was showing us, what was given to him in Revelation to show us something. Something that emphasizes even what our future is, but shows something else, something that I've, uh, I've tried to emphasize, that when they all came to worship, the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. How important do you think your prayers are? Do you think of them as incense being offered on the golden altar before the throne of God the Father, the one who fills the entire universe with his presence, the one who organizes and orders everything that we see? You know, one of the big things in the news this week, we're talking about, you know, they, they finally discovered or verified part of Einstein's uh, theory that he made uh, on, relatively, on re relativity over 100 years ago, talking about gravitational waves, how you can have these waves going through the universe from uh, ancient times and moving time and space. You know, they, they're, they're, they're talking a little bit about this. Of course, the news people are saying, what do we say about this? How do we understand this? Well, you know, in many ways, mankind is just like if, if we were sitting in the mouth of a cave with a you know, with our, with our drums and tapping on our drums. We're just learning about the universe. But how important do your prayers, how are your prayers? Well, how do you think? When you pray, are you, are you motivated? Do you have this vision of, the, of your prayers coming up in, before the throne of God? The Apostle Paul prayed for spiritual power and understanding to fill the church. If you'd turn with me here to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. I want to cite this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Ephesians and of, of the epistles of Paul, Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, 
I kneel before the Father. See, he's coming before the throne room of God. You know, he's coming to put some more of the incense in these gold bowls that are being offered on this golden altar before God, as it were, his prayers. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you. See, he prays that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his spirit, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray, Paul said, that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Just like Jesus himself, it pleased God the Father to fill him with his fullness. And Christ wants to see that we're also, that you and I are filled with his fullness. Can you and I be motivated to pray for this power to be strengthened in the, in the inner person, in the inner, through his spirit. We pray for understanding to fill the church. Let's take a look here. Let's go to Ephesians here in the first chapter. Just turn a few pages over there in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1. How Paul prayed, the kind of prayer that he gave for the new babes in Christ who were coming into the church at that time, into the body of believers at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 15, saying, now I'll primarily be citing the Holman Christian Bible, and I'll, I'll mention when I switch to something else. Anyways, Ephesians 1 and verse 15, This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stopped giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Now, thanksgiving is an important part. When you pray, <laughs> give God thanks. Find something that you can be thankful for. And there are many things when you turn your mind to it that you can be thankful for. I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. <clears throat> Verse 17, I pray that the Lord... Uh, God of our, uh, G uh, well, actually, that God of our G Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. <coughs> See, this spirit of wisdom and revelation, this is how <coughs> we can understand the things of God. This is very important, verse 18. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so you may know what is the hope of his calling. See, he's praying about this, that, the, that these new babes in Christ, that these new Christians can understand, the, the, they have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge so that they can understand the hope of his calling. What is their future? Where are they going? What are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints? Well, we already heard about some of that, didn't we? That there is a kingdom that is being prepared for us, that we're going to participate with God in a future, that you have a future. There is a hope in his calling. What is the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe? That's a remarkable thing. Think about this. He's praying that these people will have that understanding according to the working of his vast strength. And it indeed is. You know, it is amazing when we think about this. Could you use prayers like this? Somebody praying that you would have this, this spirit of wisdom and understanding and God's revelation, to have an understanding of your calling and this hope of glory, to have the fullness of Christ dwelling in you? Now, I could use prayers like this. I'm sure you could too. Prayer played a vital role in the life of the early church. It was critical to the church of God. It is one of the, it is essential. It's one of those things that we, we, we must be devoted to. Let's turn to Acts in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. 
This is one of the, you know, one of the things that you see. Who are the people of God? Well, the people of God are praying people. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. <clears throat> After he had said this, and that is, of course, Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrected Christ, he was taken up as they were watching. See, they saw him come up, and they saw him going to heaven. And a cloud took him out of their sight, and while he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them, the angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to a room upstairs where they were staying. And that was Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, all these disciples, all these men who had walked with Jesus for three and a half years across Galilee and Judea and even up into what we'd call Lebanon to, now, to today and across over to what we'd now call Jordan. All these men who were with them, all they continued united in prayer along with the women, probably some of the wives of the apostles, like Peter we know is married including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So James was there, and so was Jude, or Judah, you know, who later on would write epistles that are in the Bible right now. All these continually were united in prayer. Let's go to Acts, Acts 2, 38. Acts 2, 38. And this prayer prepared them. They filled them with the power of God in the inset. They would be able to do the mission they were given. Acts 2.38, Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Yeah, Peter was having to pre, pre, you know, present the gospel, the message of what was the truth that had been revealed, that he would have an understanding that had been given to him uh, by God, by Jesus in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, for us to understand even something simple as, you know, this statement here in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, this is completely different than the understanding that you commonly hear from the Roman Universal Church, you know, with their liturgical uh, sacraments of infant uh, baptism, sprinkling, um, and the idea of penance, there's the sacrament of penance, you know, which ostensibly, you know, their idea of repentance, well, it would forgive you or remit from you the eternal consequences of your sin, but not the temporary consequences of punishment. You're going to end up in purgatory. Well, well, the things you've done, you still have to pay for it. I mean, they have a very, very different understanding of this. When we pray and we're asking to be filled with God's spirit of wisdom and understanding, we're doing this so we can rightly divide the word of truth. He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which, of course, and I, I figure I, I, I need to make this point, who receives the Holy Spirit? Is it anybody who says, well, I'm a Christian or I'm affiliated with a Christian or I, I was baptized as a child, you know, is something like this, or I, you know, is it just anybody? Who, God gives his spirit to whom? Acts 5.32. This is, this is very important. Who does God give his spirit to? We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who obey him. Coulter says which, of course. We are witnesses. You know, God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. If we want to pray, if we want to have a relationship with God, we must obey him. It is very important. Verse 39 here, going back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children, for all who are 
afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. See, God will call those whom he chooses. As many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he's testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. And really, if you think about it, if that generation was corrupt, what about ours? I think we would put to shame the people in the first century A.D. as far as corruptness. I, I, I think we can do a better job. Verse 41, So those who accepted the message were baptized that day. About 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves. And what did these new converts into, into the truth do? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Why did the apostles in the early church realize that they needed to devote themselves to the prayers? Well, because they had a job to do. They had a job to do, and it wasn't going to be an easy job. It was going to be a difficult job. And they had to have God's strength. They had to have God's power. They had to have God's assurance and wisdom to do it. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. <clears throat> now Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex. When did they visit the temple? At the hour of prayer. See, they were going up to pray. They were looking also for an opportunity. They were going up at the hour of prayer, so in praying they were looking for God's direction, and of course they were going to participate in the, the, the prayer that was commonly held, a group prayer, at three in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful so he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. And Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us. That Peter and John... They were, as it were, prayed up. They were continuing in prayer because they knew they had a job to do. And to do this, they had to be close to God. They had to have this relationship. Look at us. So the beggar turned to them and expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. It wasn't the man who was there who was lame, the man who was, whose feet, whose ankles, whose legs didn't permit him to stand. It wasn't his faith that was on, that was the, 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 the acting factor here. It was Peter and John's, and they would have this faith through prayer, and they were going during the hour of prayer. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, and started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Not only were his feet and his ankles healed, but he had all the muscles in his legs and the coordination and everything he needed to walk. You know, how long did it take you, you know, to learn to walk? As a baby, you learn to, you know, stumble and crawl. You know, you crawl, you stumble, you fall, and all of a sudden you learn to walk. Well, it would have been the same way for this fellow, but the miracle that was performed was remarkable. So all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one that used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they were speaking to the people, the priest, the commander of the temple police, <laughs> yeah, they had temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them. Okay, the religious establishment. They were going to upset. The, they were upsetting. Jesus upset the religious establishment. Peter and John were no, under no illusions that they would be happy to see them <laughs> and hear what they had to say because they were provoked that they were teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead using Jesus as the example. These people were upset. They didn't want to hear the, you know, they're teaching about Jesus. 
it would be like today, you know, in many ways, if a presidential candidate in the United States got up and said, well, okay, you know, instead of talking politics, let me teach you a little bit about Jesus and what I've learned about Jesus. And what would people say? What would they do? They would go, ah, you know, they, could you possibly imagine? Could you possibly imagine? Because they were provoked that the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead using Jesus as the example. So they seized them and put them in custody until the next day since it was already evening. And let's go down here to verse 13, verse 13. And when they realized and observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, okay, from their perspective, they were fishermen. They were probably literate and could read and write, but they had not gone to their schools. They didn't have the formal training. They didn't have any of that. They were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in response. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign evident to all who live in Jerusalem has been done through them. We cannot deny it. They had continued in prayer. The time, it was, the, the, the Gospels show us in the book of Acts that this miracle God was able to do through them. However, so that this is then spreading further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in his name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to uh, preach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. How many people today in our society don't want us to preach or teach in the name of Jesus? Really? <laughs> you know, a lot. A lot. In fact, it's getting worse and worse. I don't know, you know, in a variety of countries, I couldn't do a podcast like this. I'd have people banging down the door to haul me off and throw me in some jail. If I was trying to do this in Iran, or if I was trying to do this in Saudi Arabia, or if I was trying to do this in a variety of places. In verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide, for we are unable to speak about what, except what we've seen and heard, and after threatening them further, they released them, finding no way to punish them, because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For the sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. And after they were released, this is Peter and John, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and elders had said to them. They repeated all the threats. We're going to take it out of your hide. It's going to cost. You're going to pay. You guys do continue to do this sort of thing. You can imagine all the things they threaten them with. When they heard this, they raised their voices to God. They prayed to God. That's what it means. Verse 24, they raised their voices to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You said through your Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers assembled against the Lord and against his Messiah. They were doing it then and just as they're doing it now. You know, it's getting harder and harder. You know, even in the, this, this, uh, this week in our national newspaper, you know, there were... There are all sorts of things going on here that, you know, there's a university that calls itself Christian in this particular country. It's a private university. But everybody else doesn't want them to have a law school because I say you can't teach Christian morality and ethics. You can't ask your people who attend you to restrain themselves sexually and, do what the, and follow biblical morality. We will not have it and we won't allow it. And then, you know, still at this point in time, you know, they can go to court, you know, and they can file their suits, and they're, they're not yet hauling us away, but as the writer of this particular article said, what does this mean? How long are they going to tolerate me? How long will they tolerate anyone who has these beliefs before they start asking, are you a Christian? No, you can't practice law. Are you a Christian? No, we're not going to have you do this. We're, you can't do this. Verse 27, for in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate 
with the Gentiles and your people Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, and <clears throat> to do whatever uh, your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So they understood, you know, God had allowed Jesus to be sacrificed. He had allowed him to be murdered because he had a plan. Verse 29, and now, Lord, consider their threats. And what do they say? What is the prayer? And grant your slaves that your slaves may speak your message with complete boldness. They prayed, grant that we might have the boldness to preach in spite of these threats by people who can carry them out. They had the power to carry out their threats on their bodies. They had the power to confiscate their property. They had the power to have them executed. Grant that your slaves may speak your message with complete boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing, signs, and wonders to be performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Because you see, it's one thing to come up, I have this new religious philosophy, and you start spotting it. Every, today, you have, you know, not just a thousand and one, practically a million and one people coming up with their own ideas. But you know, they're not, you know, they're not doing the sort of healing miracles that Peter and John did. Miracles that gave the church a kickstart. Thousands of people came in as a result of these things. Verse 31, when they had prayed, it says, verse 31 here in Acts, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. See, there was a result to their prayer. God wanted them to know at this critical juncture of time, and it was, don't lose heart. Don't be scared. Yeah, you saw what they did to your master and Lord, your rabbi, Jesus, you, they saw how you beat him to a pulp and nailed him to a stake in one of the most excruciating forms of torture. Don't be scared in spite of this. The place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak God's message with boldness, with boldness. This wasn't Pentecost, this was later. It was response to their prayer and God granted them an answer with strength. God does hear prayer, but he expects some things. He, if we're, we're going to have our prayers answered and we're going to be filled with boldness, we have to have, understand how God wants us to approach this and where, you know, what we need, how we need to do this to have our prayers answered in, in the, such a similar way with power that we may effectively do what he wants us to do in our lives, to speak, to speak the gospel and to live it with boldness. Because this is not an easy time. You know, I, it's, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to stand up and be counted. And that means that we're not going to be part of the majority. We're going to be part of a despised minority. Mark chapter 11 and verse 20. Mark chapter 11 and verse 20. I'm going to read this in the Amplified uh, Version of the Bible. In the morning when they, that's Jesus and his disciples, were passing along, they noticed that the fig tree... This was the disciples noticed it and brought this up. The fig tree was withered completely away to its root. <clears throat> see, they'd gone by the previous day, and Jesus had gone looking for an early fig, and it hadn't been there. But see, he knew there wouldn't be anything there at that time of the year. But it was, he was making a point to them. It was a teaching thing. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you doomed or which you cursed has withered away. And Jesus replied and said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God constantly. See, that was the message. Jesus had showed them, you know, the simple thing. Here's a fig tree. You know, uh, okay, you know, we're going to make it a, a, an object lesson. And he, and he cursed it that it would wither away in using it as, as a metaphor for the religious establishment of that time. <clears throat> Have faith in God constantly. <clears throat> Verse 23. Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown in the sea, and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes what he says, uh, says will take place, it will be done for him. What a statement. What a statement Jesus has said. <clears throat> if you say to a mountain, be lifted up and thrown in the sea, and you don't doubt at all in your heart, it'll be done. 
Verse 24, for this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you, and you will get it. And whenever you stand praying, okay, you don't have to just pray kneeling, okay? As Jews, they were used to standing in groups and praying. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. Oh, so the corollary of this is you want to have your prayers heard. You want to have boldness with God. Well, you've got to also <laughs> eliminate some things from your life. If you have a hard heart, if you have resentments against people, in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your failings and shortcomings. So if we want to be able to have boldness with God, to be able to come before him and to pray and have our prayer be effective, well, there are things we have to, we have to organize in our life. We have to approach God with a clear conscience. We have to approach God in full assurance of faith that, our, you know, that we don't have stuff that's bothering us. James 1, let's go to the, of James. James being... Jesus, one of Jesus' brothers. In fact, they found, they believe they found his, uh, you know, well, these days we call it a casket, but his ossuary that he, his bones were buried in, you know, that they, they mentioned this. Probably is, was his, uh, James, uh, James' ossuary. Anyways, James 1 and verse 2, and I'll cite this in the expanded Bible version. My brothers and sisters, when you have many kinds of troubles, you should be full of joy. Because you know that these troubles test your faith, and this will give you patience. This will give you perseverance. This will give you endurance. Now, none of us likes to hear that. <laughs> we like to think, you know, we just pray and it all goes away. It doesn't quite work that way. As James is saying, James, the brother of Jesus, who was there, you know, when they were praying right after Jesus' ascension, it mentions, will give you, you know, when all these troubles test your faith, this will give you patience, perseverance, and endurance. And let your patience show itself perfectly in what you do. That is, have its full effect, to have it finish its work. Then you will be perfect and complete, that is, mature or whole completely mature, and you will have everything you need. But if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God for it. Well, there we go. Pray for wisdom. Sometimes we have trials and tribulations, and there's a reason for them, for us to learn something from it. When we ask God to understand these things, he's generous to everyone and will give you wisdom without criticizing you. But when you ask God, you must believe. That's, you must ask in faith. When you get on your knees or you stand and you pray, we ask God in faith and not, do not doubt. Anyone who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blowing up and down, you know, back and forth, driven and tossed by the wind. Such doubters are thinking two different things at the same time. It literally, it's called doubled-minded. They cannot decide about anything they do. That is, they're unstable in what they do. People who are like, if we're double-minded, we shouldn't expect that we'll receive anything from the Lord. We can't, you know, be of, of two minds of something. The Amplified puts verse 8 here. It says this, For being as he is, a man of two minds, that is hesitating, dubious, irresolute, he is unstable. If you're irresolute, if you're hesitating, if you're dubious, you're unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks or feels or decides. When we have decisions and we need to go, we need to make a choice, we need to go to God on our knees or standing, however you're going to pray, whatever your physical situation may be, as some people say the best prayers they've ever prayed are upside down and hanging by their feet in a well. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, so the position isn't so important, but when you pray, you know, we do it in a, such a way that we're, asked, we're putting it to God and then we trust. We put, our, we put our lives in His hand. 
and we go with it. And we see what comes to pass. And when we ask and we pray, we must pray in love. If you're asked for a mountain to be, you know, if I was asked the mountains over here to be picked up and tossed into the sea, well, how many people would die from that? All these people in our harbor, in Naimo Harbor, there'd be tons of people that would die. Everybody along the seashore, there'd be this enormous tidal wave. It would kill, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people just here in Nanaimo to do something like that. We must, when we, you know, Jesus was using that as an example, but we need to understand, you know, from the literal concept that when we ask, we ask not, you know, speciously, but we, we ask in love. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 2. I'm going to quote this in the Amplified Bible version. And if I have prophetic powers, and there are lots of people who like to say that, and there are lots of people in the Church of God who like to say that, I have prophetic powers, you know, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose. Hey, there's some people who built their entire church organizations on that premise, okay? And understanding all the secret truths, mysteries, and possess all knowledge, and they're a pile of them. In fact, you get some various church thing, you don't see people advertising, I know what 666 means, I know what this is, I know all this. You see all that stuff in, you know, in Church of God literature, much less you have tons of it in the world as well. So if I have all this stuff and I can do all this stuff and I'm this great guru, you know, with prophetic powers, and if I have sufficient faith so I can remove mountains, okay, they're saying, boy, I, when I ask it, I, I name it and I claim it, you know, this sort of thing. But have not love. Don't really have God's love within them. I am nothing. I'm a useless nobody, the way the Amplified puts it. You think that person, such a person without love, is going to have their prayers answered? Only as God sees fit. God expects something from us. He expects something of his people. He expects even more of his leaders. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul, this was, you know, Paul wrote this at the very end of his ministry, just before he was going to be murdered by the Romans. For preaching the gospel. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank God always, as I mention you in my prayers, day and night. I serve him doing what I know what is right. I serve him with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did. He had a clear conscience. When he prayed, he could go before God and he didn't have all sorts of things that were dragging him down that would cause him to doubt that God would hear his prayers. And these things we must be, we must appear what we are. There are a lot of people in this world who like to appear what they are not. Let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 19 and verse 46. And this is a warning because the Christian world, the Christian establishment is full of frauds, fakes, Hypocrites. Luke chapter 19 and verse 46, and he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. In other words, they were practicing the religion because they could make a good profit on it. How many people do you see doing that? Oh, you know, there's no end to the televangelists and this sort of stuff and, you know, the, 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 you know all these things on religious TV. No end of it. Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20 and verse 45. Here Jesus is accusing leaders. Leaders who say they stand for him and represent him. Luke chapter 20 and verse 45. While the people were listening, Jesus said to his followers, to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. Beware of the scribes. Beware of all those teaching people that I am the Christ. He later on would, would talk about that in, in Matthew 24, okay, in the Olivet Prophecy. 
They like to walk around wearing fancy clothes or flowing robes. You know, they still like to do that. You know, even all, to almost 2,000 years later, you see these people get up there, they, you know, and they're religious, they're going to wear their religious garment. You know, when they, they stand in the balcony there at Rome, when they've got all the robes, they've got, you know, all this stuff, all the accoutrements. And then Protestant churches, it's the same way, but a good deal of them. They, they like to walk around wearing flowing robes, fancy clothes, and they, and they love... <laughs> Uh, and they love for people to greet them with respect in their marketplaces. And they, you know, they like their titles. They love to have the most important seats in the synagogues. Jesus was saying at the time, yeah, the chief seats. And the place of highest honor at the feasts and banquets, for his 47. But they cheat widows and steal their houses. They devour widows' homes. And they try to make themselves look good by saying long prayers. You know, they have false motives when they're praying. Jesus says such people, such leaders, such Christian leaders, at the, at the time when Jesus was, was walking on the earth, it was leaders in his community who were Jewish leaders, but it's the same thing right now, far more hypocrites. They will receive a greater punishment, a greater condemnation. If we want our prayers to be answered, if we can't do what Jesus absolutely abhors, and that's the hypocrisy among his people is one thing that he detests. Let's go to Romans 12 and verse 12. What is another aspect if we want to have our prayers answered? Romans 12, 12. Be joyful because you have hope. Okay. We have hope. That's one of the greatest differences that separate us from every other, you know, person walking around out there. We have hope. You have hope. Be joyful. Rejoice in hope. Be patient. Be ready to endure. Because you have this hope, be ready to endure. Most of the enduring right now just consists of, you know, a lot of it is we're, we're ignored, we're separated, we're this, that, or the other, okay? We're not popular. Endure. When trouble comes, suffering or tribulation, you know, just endure it. And pray at all times. Pray faithfully. Pray with persistence. Pray with perseverance. Let's go to Luke 18. Luke, Luke 18. Jesus was very strong on this question for us. Because just as, you know, James was saying, as his brother James was saying, his half-brother, you know, when we, you know, we're, we're going to have problems. And he's saying this to the church. This was in the first century. Call it all joy when we're having all these problems, you know. And we're learning to put our, you know, priorities straight and realizing where we are. Luke 18 and verse 1. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show how they should always pray and never give up. Boy, this is a good one to repeat and remember. Luke 18. There was a judge in a certain city who said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. Yeah, that's a lot of them right now. They don't fear God and they certainly don't care about the people. A widow of the city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to them, said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. This is the New Living Translation, by the way. This woman's driving me crazy. Meshuggah, I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. <laughs> then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Verse 8, I tell you, and this is Jesus' assurance to you and to me, I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But, and here's this, you know, <laughs> this typical Jesus way, he's going to ask a question, but when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? The just are going to have to live by faith. 
and faith is, you know, at, at this point in time in the 21st century, it doesn't look like those who care for the, the truths of Christianity and what the Bible teach are going to be around, you know, are, are going to be able to, to make much changes or have great influence. It looks like it's getting increasingly difficult and we're going to be persecuted. We're being marginalized like crazy these days. Romans 1, Romans 1, chapter 8, Romans 1, chapter 8. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Okay, here's Paul. Paul saying, you know, the first thing I do is I thank God for my brethren. Because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. Of course, here he's writing to the Romans. He's writing to them and saying, hey, because you are the capital city where Rome is, you know, this little despised sect of whatever is actually being talked about. It's, it's getting some buzz. Social media of the day. God knows how often I pray for you. See, Paul was a praying man. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. When we have needs, when we have people who we know have needs, who are brethren in the church specifically, first of all, to the household of faith, as well as all men, we bring them before God. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come to you and see you. He's writing the Romans this. For I long to visit you so I can bring some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, he's saying in verse 13, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. See, when he's writing this, he's thinking, now I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to Rome. I'm going to get to do this. He'd sent this letter by hand of a faithful servant, I'm sure. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit just as I've seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. I'm eager to come to you to Rome too to preach the good news, he writes here. Well, what was it going to take? Did, you know, I have a feeling, you know, from when Paul wrote uh, this in Romans 1 and what actually happened, I think there was a certain amount of time and Paul had no idea what God was going to have to do to get him to Rome. It was going to be, it was going to be something else. Let's go to Acts chapter 27, Acts 27 here, and verse 18. You know, he, he eventually, he, he did. He, on the way to Rome, he, he passed through Jerusalem, but there he was, you know, the, the Romans picked him up as a prisoner because he set off a riot in the temple where they tried to kill him. He went through all this. He was hauled in. You read the whole story. He is hauled in before the, the Roman council and before the local Jewish client king. He had to give a testimony and all these sorts of things. And then he was given as, you know, to a, to a centurion to haul off as a prisoner because he finally had to appeal to Caesar to have his case because otherwise he would have been handed over and, and just assassinated in some alley someplace. So here he is and he's on his way to Rome as a prisoner in chains. I don't think when he wrote Romans 1 he had that in mind. <laughs> he was praying to come there. God said, okay, all right. Verse 18 and there they are, and all of a sudden in this ship, and they're trying to sail after the Day of Atonement in the Eastern Mediterra Mediterranean, and it was not a good idea. But we were violently tossed by the tempest, and the next day they cast out the cargo to lighten the ship. And on the third day, they threw the ship's equipment overboard with our own hands. I mean, they're, they're bobbing up and down. They're afraid of sinking. But when neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days and no small tempest was lying on us, all hope of our being saved was taken away. See, through many trials and tribulations, you know, we're come. When Paul, you know, we are perfected in these, he could have cited James. Maybe, maybe, maybe James had talked to him about this before he went there and he had a chop doing to think about it. Then after a long period of silence, Paul stood up 
in the midst of these dispirited people who are on this boat and said, oh man, you should have listened to me. You should not have set sail from Crete and you would not have been spared this disaster and loss. But I exhort you now to be of good cheer because there shall not be any loss of life among you, only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God whose I am and whom I serve saying, Have no fear, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has given to you all those sailing with you. See, I'm sure all of all this boat was being tossed up and down. Paul was praying. He was persistent and constant in prayer. He didn't want it to be fish food. He didn't want those who were traveling with him to be fish food. And so then, be of good cheer, men, for I believe God. He wasn't double-minded, that it will be exactly as was told to me. But we must be cast upon a certain island. Okay, we're going to be shipwrecked there. Let's go here. What was the outcome of all this? You can read the story a little bit later. Let's go to 28 and verse 16. 28 and verse 16. They did. He did make it to Rome. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the commander of the camp, but Paul was allowed to remain by himself and the soldier who kept them. He was given favor. Even though he was a prisoner, he was allowed, if it were, house arrest. He had a chain. He had a, he had a soldier living with him, you know, from this standpoint, but he was allowed. He had, he had a few things. Now, it came to pass that after three days, Paul called together those who were chief among the Jews, and when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, although I have not done nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, I was delivered into the hands of the Romans as a prisoner from Jerusalem. So all these things, he had prayed that he would be, be able to go and share with the Romans, the brethren who were in Rome, the gospel. God heard his prayer, but boy, between the time he prayed and when he finally arrived there, he got a chance to pray a lot more. In verse 30, it says this, And Paul remained, verse, Acts 28 and verse 30, And Paul remained two whole years in his own hired house, welcoming all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus with all boldness, no man forbidding him. See, God answered his prayers during that time. He answered his prayer, but wow, all the things that came to pass. When we pray, we should expect answers. They may not be, however, the answers we expect. But yet God is merciful. As he said, he heard Paul's prayer because Paul prayed with a clear conscience. He wasn't a hypocrite. And he persevered in his prayer. Let's go to Romans, excuse me, Revelation chapter 8. Revelations chapter 8. We wind this up. Revelations 8 and verse 1. Back to the Holman Christian Standard Bible. When he opened the seventh seal, this is Christ. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour because of the portent, the gravity of the situation in the end times and what were the implications. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. This is in the throne room of God the Father. And he was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the gold altar in front of the throne. The prayers of all the saints are being offered in a sacrifice on the throne before God the Father. When you pray, where do your prayers go? They don't just go to the ceiling of your room. They're going to the throne room of God. And they're going to be presented there. And the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's right hand. And the angel took the incense burner and filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth, and there were rumblings of thunder and flashes and lightnings and an earthquake. All these things come to pass. But among them, for us, it was the prayers of the saints, which was holy, and it's, a, it's part of the sacrifice being presented 
before God the Father. Let's finish with this verse of Paul, who while he was, for all the things he went through on his way to Rome, to tossed in that boat and shipwrecked and then bitten by serpents and all this other stuff, Paul says this, Philippians 4 and verse 6, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition, petition, making the definite request. Like Paul, when he was in that boat and they were tossing him around and in danger of drowning in the middle of the ocean, he was requesting that God would deliver them. It was a definite request. With, but he says, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, giving God thanks. Because his mercy never fails. Continue to make your wants known to God. Continue to make your wants, your needs, known to God. And the God of peace, that, this peace, that tranquil state of, of being, of the inner being, because we're assured of our salvation through Christ, and we have nothing to fear because we are reconciled and living in covenant with God, and we're content with the things that God gives us on this earthly lot, whatever it might be. And God's peace, which transcends all understanding, shall garrison and mount the guard over your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. This is one of the outcomes we want from our prayer. The prayer of the saints, the incense before the throne of God. When we pray, it is of vital importance and it is of great significance. Let's pray for each other as we do pray and keep in mind why we're praying, some of the things we need to do to make sure our prayers are answered and to have our faith set in God who certainly hears and know how very important it is and where we're going. Brethren, let's rejoice and let's give thanks and let's pray for one another that God might give us the boldness we need to preach the gospel as he did to the apostles so many years ago.